Well, after a one-issue romp back in Sonic, which was a continuation from a story started in the last two issues of Knuckles, we're once again going back to Knuckles for the direct follow-up to that story that was continued in Sonic. Fun. We've returned to the Lost Tribe covers, and it's once again pretty good, Echidna Feet and Pouty Face notwithstanding. It's once again a procession of the Lost Tribe through a canyon, though this time we still see them walking away from the camera instead of towards it, while visages of Sonic, Knuckles, and Rob stand tall in the sky. It's a pretty good cover, all things considered. We open right where we left off, with Sonic, Knuckles, and friends standing on a balcony overlooking Yanar's execution. While Marianne is pretty damn distraught over what's about to happen, Knuckles shows some pretty good leadership skills, delegating tasks to each of his friends for what they should do, including cutting the rope, distracting the guards, helping the tribe get out of harm's way, and grabbing Yanar. It's actually pretty impressive seeing Knuckles take on a leadership role so quickly and efficiently. So much so that over the next couple of pages, the plan starts to go off without a hitch. Rob cuts Yanar's rope, Sonic grabs him, Knuckles and Tails distract the High Sheriff and the Hangman, while Marianne grabs herself a sword and starts cutting her way to the main gate. It's a pretty chaotic scene, but it does actually flow pretty nicely. And with so many moving pieces, it's surprisingly easy to tell what is going on. We eventually run into a roboticized Buck, a friar who Rob recognizes as one of his team. While he wants to try and bring him with them, with him still under the robot mind control, it means he would be more of a danger than anything else. Rob uses fire arrows to create a wall of flame between the tribe and the sheriff's men, not sure why the robots would be afraid of flame, but it seems to work, allowing everyone to make a run for the main gate and make it out into the woods. Sonic decides that it might be best to keep what they discovered about Antoine's father from him, at least for the time being. And before the sheriff can do anything, Rob fires one last arrow into a storeroom full of explosives, which places like this always seem to have lying around. And then the castle blows up, like straight up. Of course, Rob is somehow perfectly fine despite being right next to the explosion that was powerful enough to level a fortified structure. He's even brought back Mari's brothers, who were hiding in his tree hut when he found them wandering the woods. So glad to see we've closed off that loose end. Then we cut back to the floating island and get back to the whole dying old man subplot that was started, what, like six issues ago now? Locke and Saber are standing over Hawking, talking with Dio and Arky about how he's too weak to pull himself through on his own, and noting how ironic it is that their society went to war over technology, and that tech is now the only thing keeping Hawking alive. Against his will, might I remind you, he was perfectly willing to just move on. And yes, it is very ironic, and also incredibly hypocritical of your entire order, as I've pointed out many times. Actually, Dio points out that it was only one echidna that set all of this off, but then he points out that where the Legion is all bad, the Guardians are all good. You had me until that last part, because Ken isn't exactly consistent with his portrayals of morality. Dio tries to lay it out like it's black and white here, when the actions and words of the Guardians really sort of gray the whole situation up. Not saying that the Legion, at least as it is right now, has any real redeeming qualities, but come on. They're contacted by Remington, who tells them that the Chaotix have accepted their task, though they're still reluctant to work with Julie Sue. Remington also brings up the fact that Lorelei's been trying to get in touch with Locke through him, and Locke merely tells him to tell her that he'll be in touch soon before ending the transmission. So after that scene, we cut back to Knuckles and Friends again. Sonic and Tails decide to head back to their plane and continue on their way, though Knuckles does tell them that they're welcome to drop by the floating island at any time. So yeah, they are definitely fast friends at this point. Points for continuity there. Yanar talks with Knuckles, stating that when he thought he was going to die, he had a vision, how narratively convenient, about the city that they're looking for, and that Rob is apparently the other, the one who is destined to lead them to where they have to go to end their journey. Meanwhile, Rob is monologuing how he won't stop fighting until the crazy critters are free, because apparently that's the name of his merry band, and Mari promises that she wants to help fight alongside him. Knuckles interrupts their moment and asks Rob if he knows anything about the place matching the description of what Yanar saw, 
And then Rob goes slack-jawed and starts walking as if he's gone into some sort of trance, walking along that way until he nearly walks off the edge of a cliff, overlooking an island that looks like it has some sort of Stonehenge ruins on it. Though Rob says he has no idea why he was beckoned here. He's certainly never been there. Cut over to Lara Lay, who is told by her boyfriend Wynne that Locke would be in touch soon. When she asks if that's all that was said, she notes that it definitely sounds like Locke, who was never one for conversation. And with that totally necessary page out of the way, we cut back to the tribe walking down onto the beach, where Rob says that while he's never been to the Isle, he's always felt he had a duty to act as a sentry, and only allow those that were worthy to pass it. Why he's felt that way, we don't know. Sounds like more mystic stuff to me, as if we didn't already have enough of that floating around. According to the prophecy, the last leg of the journey requires something resembling a bold heart. Knuckles translate this as meaning he'll have to walk on water, but isn't exactly keen on the idea considering that he can't even swim, even though we've seen him swimming before. I take back what I said about continuity. Gnar says all he needs to do is take one small leap of faith to get them to where they need to go. And one Jesus allegory later, the tribe starts to walk across the water towards the island. All except for Marianne, who opts to stay with Rob, believing that she's found the one that she loves. So is it the soul touch that made that happen in so short an amount of time, or were they actually crushing on each other, hmm? Anyway, as Knuckles and the other echidnas reach the island, they are greeted by Gala Na, a mystical echidna who welcomes them to Albion, the original home of the echidnas. She explains that over a thousand years ago, echidna culture was so advanced compared to every other society on Mobius that they were able to build a massive city and have access to advanced technologies and medicines and such well before the rest of the world, which goes a long way to explain why they look down on pretty much everyone who isn't an echidna. But because their race wasn't satisfied with their own great achievements, pretty much the entire city decided to pack up and establish a colony in Down Under that eventually became Echidnopolis, which was then treated as the true echidna homeland. Nice to know that they were pricks even back then. While Gala Na leads the tribe into the city to help get them settled into their new home, Yanar talks with Knuckles for a moment, who says with a heavy heart that his home is back on the floating island and he needs to go back there. But Yanar gives him a parting gift, a guiding star gem, saying that Athair knew he'd have the insight to know how to use it. And so, with Athair and the walkers watching over him, Knuckles walks back toward land, leaving Albion behind. You know, I'm not crazy about how this arc started, but this and the last Sonic issue, these weren't terrible. This issue had the benefit of being straightforward like the last one without having to jump constantly between two different groups. We did get back into the more mystic stuff near the end, and the out-of-nowhere Jesus allegory seems a little at odds with the mysticism angle that they've been pushing so hard before, but then again, I'm just not a fan of this angle in the comic in general. Not even saying that the concept itself is bad, but it just doesn't feel like it belongs in this particular world. And also, it's just not written that well. Which, of course, is a constant criticism I have levied against Ken. The action scene at the beginning, as I said, is actually pretty well done, despite its chaos. And I really like the fact that everyone is not only given something to do here, but is also shown to be competent at what they're doing. But they don't completely curb stomp the enemy, they still need to be careful. It's an exciting scene. The scenes with Locke and then with Lara felt a little unnecessary, or at least Lara's did. The one with Locke was basically just a reminder that Hawking's still dying, and that the Guardians are still hypocrites who aren't nearly as in the right as they think they are given the things that they do in the name of their order. Parental abandonment doesn't make you a better fighter or a more knowledgeable scholar, it just screws you up. Again, the new characters don't leave much of an impression. Marianne was basically just made as a romantic interest for Rob. Rob, while more competent in this issue, is basically just revealed to be another Pender's plot device, and a poorly explained one at that. Even with the idea of him leading the Crazy Critters Freedom Fighters, the revelation of him being the Other was basically why he was created, because that's how Penders creates all of his characters. 
They're there to fulfill a specific purpose, not to be characters on their own. And then there's Galena, who is just a mystic thing that pops up in Albion, who is only there to deliver exposition, and that's that. Art-wise, I've nothing to say. It's the same art team as the last few issues, and apart from wide mouth syndrome cropping up here and there, the action's exciting, the expressions are good, and the backgrounds are particularly well done. The environments are actually pretty varied and well drawn, from castle to forest to field to beach to Albion. There is some good variety. I'm impressed. So yeah, this issue overall was pretty good, and it at least brought a definitive end to the story it started, even if the first few issues did pile on a few more questions and introduce some stuff that makes me raise my brow a little. So let's sally forth and continue our journey onwards as we head back to the main Sonic book with a look at Sonic the Hedgehog issue 59. I'll see you next time, everyone.